Good afternoon, everybody. I think we're going to get started. I'd like to welcome you to the 2015 Covey Lecture Series. Today, we are pleased to present Mr. Jim, or Dr. Jim Wilworth. Jim is Covey's senior scientist in viticulture here at Brock University. At Covey, Jim's work is split between addressing the research and out outreach work of the grape and wine community. Jim's major outreach projects include Vine Alert, a grapevine management and monitoring system for cold hardiness, and the grape pre-harvest monitoring program that tracks fruit maturity across Niagara. His current research examines grapevine cold hardiness, freeze protection, bird deterrence, terroir-based wine quality, and the impact of precision viticulture on wine quality. Today, Jim will be speaking about optimizing cold hardiness and winter survival in grapevines based on trials and experiences here in Ontario. Please join me in welcoming Jim Woolworth. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's great to be here today to talk uh, in, in one of the last lectures of the Covey Lecture Series. Um, this is one of my last talks on the circuit I've been doing in terms of talking about winter hardiness and, and bud survival uh, across Ontario. We've had another cold winter, so it's been a busy, uh, a busy time for the, the growers as well as myself with uh, cold hardiness related uh, research and outreach. So today I just wanted to talk today about um, some of the research that we've been doing over the last couple of years in terms of optimizing cold hardiness and vinifera vines, as well as talk about some of the trials that we've done to look at uh, improving overwintering success. So it's kind of a combination of multiple talks that I've, I've given throughout the last couple of months and over the, over the last couple of years uh, with a couple new tidbits in there. So in terms of the grapevine cold hardiness research, it's always been a priority in, our, in the Ontario wine industry, uh, particularly because we've, we have much higher uh, plantings of, of uh, Vitis vinifera wine grapes, which aren't as winter hardy as uh, the hybrids and, and some other um, Labrusca grapes that were originally planted uh, a lot in Ontario. And so cold hardiness is the limiting factor for growing many of the varieties uh, of wine grapes. And we could have global warming, if you want to say that, and have warmer growing seasons, but it's really our winters that limits us in terms of what we can grow. If we have, you know, 2,000 growing degree days, and, you know, we can maybe get Grenache to mature, uh, we won't get it through the winter because of its winter hardiness. But for the varieties that we do grow, um, it's really important to optimize the hardiness and to look at new protection ways and uh, protection strategies. And this is, has to be done in an effective and economic way. So I wanted to put this slide up. This was recently released, and this is showing the temperature trends across the world, across the globe. And what's one disturbing thing that you see here? The entire world is warming, and Eastern North America is much colder. Now that is a scary thing because the, the, one of the limiting factors for many crops grown in Eastern North America is winter hardiness. Um, you, so we're, we're our, the, the agriculture industry, as well as our, our you know, way of living potentially, could be highly impacted by this trend if this continues. And so, you know, Florida citrus all the way up to, you know, tender fruit regions of, of eastern North America are threatened. And as we all know, areas that are warming like California, Australia, and so on are are threatened with the opposite thing of, of drought and, and too much heat during the seasons. So it's, it's a pretty scary thing if this trend continues, but it just shows that how important um, cold hardiness really is in, in Eastern North America. And what some of the, the results of having, you know, these, these trends of, of, of extreme cold weather, and it's just different types of winter injury that can, that can occur. And this is uh, an example from a couple of years ago of direct damage due to, bud, due to bud damage. And you can see here, particularly these vines, they're just basically suckering from the ground. No fruit there, some chunks splitting due to freezing. These are all different ways of, of, of freeze injury, different uh, 
Uh, this is an example of the spring frost in 2012 of a, of a Labrusca bud that you know, breaks bud a little bit earlier than some of the wine grapes and that was susceptible to time and ended up getting frozen out. As well as uh, uh, some shoots that were froze uh, out by some frost as well. So in terms of how, how plants uh, withstand freezing events, um, it's really important to, to look at this process of cold hardiness if we're trying to optimize it, obviously. So when it comes to cold hardiness, the definition is really the ability of a plant tissue to survive uh, freezing temperature stresses. And it's a very complex trait. It's not like it's a single gene and it's, uh, it's, there's a lot of attributes and, and, and factors that contribute to, to cold uh, hardiness or, or cold tolerance. And it's limited really by the genetic potential uh, as well as the environment. So it's highly influenced by the environment. And you can see here in a warm, if this was, let's say, Chardonnay in our regions in Ontario, the vines will be more cold tolerant than they would be in a place like California. But again, it's limited by its genetic potential. So they can only get so, so cold hardy. And that's why there's differences between vines like riparia or native grapes or the Minnesota cultivars uh, versus uh, some of the vinifera varieties. And it also is highly dynamic. So it's changing throughout the whole dormant period. And that's a nice smoothed out uh, chart down there. But in reality, you have a lot of these ups and downs. So there's an example of what cold hardiness is and how it changes throughout dormancy. You have this period where plants are gaining cold tolerance uh, through, the, through the fall, and it's actually beginning when the fruit's maturing. And then during the midwinter months, the, the, the plants are at their maximum hardiness. And then as the temperatures start to warm, we start to deacclimate. And right now we're just starting to deacclimate. Uh, the vines are just starting to deacclimate uh, in Ontario but it's been slow because it's been a colder year and a colder spring. In 2012, for example, we vines were only hardy to negative six degrees at this time. Uh, this year, they're still hardy to negative 50 or more. So it just shows you can't look at a calendar date and say this is how hardy the, the plants will be. It does change from year to year. So in terms of how do we test the cold hardiness, this is an example of a compound grapevine bud. We're using a, a method of differential thermal analysis. So what we do is we sample the, the, the cane material with all the buds on them from the vineyard. We place them on these trees with a thermistor and, and, and the buds themselves are dissected and placed on these pelche plates. And from there, we move, in, we move them into a programmable freezer unit, which mimics uh, a freeze event. And then through all of our, uh, our data collection systems, and processing software, we're actually able to pinpoint at what time, at what temperature those buds freeze at. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was some work we've been doing for the last five years on the, how crop level and harvest date can impact uh, bud hardiness. And this has been uh, an interesting study in terms of the industry we're interested in, in looking at these types of things for some of the wine styles that we make, such as ice wine, where the vines can have heavier crop on them and then they're harvested later, as well as some of our other varieties that are important to the industry, such as Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, etc. So for this study, we wanted to do two different cropping levels. So we had two clusters per shoot and one cluster per shoot, which represented a full crop versus a half crop. And then looking at two different harvest dates for each cropping level of um, uh, first harvest was done at commercial uh, time, where we were working in commercial vineyards. And the next one was done uh, three weeks later after the harvest. So there's an example of a Merlot trial with uh, one cluster per shoot versus two cluster per shoot. And this is a common thing that we found with many of the cultivars and with many of the treatments, where that acclimation was delayed, so the plants were slower to gain cold tolerance with the heavier crop vines, as well as the vines that were harvested later. However, generally speaking, um, in most cases and in most years, the vines ultimately uh, reached about the same maximum hardiness. So they reached their same genetic uh, potential in terms of how cold tolerant they would be. But because there were some differences in terms of their acclimation, and, and in sometimes there were some differences in terms of maximum hardiness, there were some uh, changes later in the season as well, which I'll talk about. 
But this was the general trend, was that heavier crops and later harvests slowed down the acclimation rate. But in some years, like 2012, which was a very good vintage, I would say, um, we didn't find much difference with varieties like Sauvignon Blanc, regardless of the, when we harvested the vines or when or how heavy they were in terms of their crop levels. We didn't really find any differences here. And I just put this in table form just to uh, mix it up a little bit. But you can see here that it's 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 pretty much uh, very little. There are no differences hardly at all. Even without even statistics, you could say they're not uh, significantly different. For Pinot Noir, which is very uh, responsive to to crop. Um, in, in this year, the, 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 the vines, the, the inherent crop potential of the, of the vines was low. And there, again, you see, well, there's some differences in terms of the heavier crop vines were slow, a little bit slower uh, to acclimate, but again, no differences throughout the rest of the dormancy. The following year though, the crop levels were a bit higher. And what we found was even a, a, a couple kilograms per vine difference had remarkable differences in terms of the cold tolerance. And I say remarkable when it's a couple degrees difference in terms of cold tolerance, because one or two degrees is all it takes from no crop to uh, a full crop. And so Pinot Noir was probably one of the most responsive varieties in terms of uh, how uh, crop level as well as harvest date impacted um, the, uh, the tolerance, the, the cold tolerance. Riesling was also, uh, uh, we also found differences in terms of how crop level and harvest date impacted um, cold tolerance, but in reality, they, it was a lot less uh, responsive to crop levels, but it did respond, we found that Riesling responded uh, to timing of harvest a little bit more. It was, it's pretty resilient in terms of cropping levels. If it was one or two kilograms per difference uh, in terms of the, the two treatments, we really didn't see too much separation. But there, was some, there were some differences in terms of the timing of the harvest. And Chardonnay was similar, where we found some big separation in some of the higher cropped years, like 2013, where we had a large crop across on Ontario. And when those vines with the full crop or were harvested later, were, were less cold tolerant. You can see here the half crop treatments that were, that were picked uh, at the normal com first commercial harvest um, you can see we're much more cold tolerant even later in the season. So they acclimated better and then also since they, they were in deeper dormancy, they, they were slower to come out. And that's important for something like Chardonnay which can be susceptible to early bud break. Uh, and this is just an example of looking at Merlot from after last year. And last year we had a, we had a tough winter and Merlot was pretty beat up in, in some areas for sure. And I just wanted, when we were out in the vineyard reflagging the vines and looking at the trial, um, we found that, we f I want to take some pictures because we saw some obvious differences in terms of how the vines looked. Um, just a visual inspection, you could see some differences here. So this was a, uh, some Merlot that were um, with the lighter crop treatment and they were harvested earlier versus a heavier crop Merlot with the later harvest. So more uneven bud break and in less bud survival. And I don't have the, the slide up there, but we also, they, it was significantly different in terms of the bud survival uh, between um, the heavier crop and the, and the lighter crop. And here's just an example of a vine that's totally overcropped. And not only will you not get that fruit mature, but I can guarantee you that that cane is not going to get through the, uh, the winter. So it's just an example of just the extreme of, of crop level. So I wanted to talk a little bit about just some of the yield response we found across the board. Um, and generally speaking, and we had a good vintage, and I'm saying a, a better vintage, I guess, I'm talking about an earlier season where we had uh, later or earlier bud break, a warmer season and, and, and really a warmer fall and drier fall. Uh, when we had those types of conditions, there was less of an impact of crop level for sure. Um, and, and also harvest date. The vines, the fruit maturity was good, and so the vine maturity also was, was pretty good. Um, some varieties were still um, very responsive to even a slight difference in terms of uh, crop levels, but the, the effects were definitely a lot less in those types of vintages. But we do have many years where we have cooler and wetter conditions, especially in the fall, and acclimation is delayed anyways from our research that we've done over the years. 
that we do find that acclimation is delayed in those types of situations. And in those types of situations, one kilogram per vine can even make a difference in terms of uh, some of the varieties such as Merlot and Pinot, which were very, very responsive to crop level. So that might not be a big deal to, you know, to improve hardiness by one or two degrees, but in a winters like we just had this year, this year and last year, that could be make the world of difference in terms of how much bud survival you have. Uh, you know, a big difference between 60% survival and 30%. In terms of just how variety responses, from looking at over the, the three years of data, at least, we have three years of data for most of these, um, the most responsive was definitely Pinot Noir, where, and, and as, a, as a, uh, a grape grower or winemaker, I think we know that it's, it is very yield sensitive, and a variety like Riesling was the least, and Merlot and Sauvignon Blanc were somewhere in between, as well as Chardonnay and Cap Franc. But with Chardonnay, Cap Franc, Riesling, for example, being plateau price varieties, those yields can get quite high. And you, I think you have to really be aware of that, that if you're cropping at nine ton an acre for vinifera, uh, you could be in some trouble in terms of how, how well they're going to acclimate. But again, it comes down to this whole thing of vine balance, really. If you, if you can support a larger crop, then you can get away with, with um, with some, some uh, higher crop levels. But again, if you can't get that fruit to mature, likely your vines aren't maturing uh, well either in terms of their uh, acclimation, their cold acclimation rates. Uh, in terms of some other factors, like this is pretty much a no brainer, but a, he a healthier plant is going to survive winter better. Just like if you have a, a cold or you're stressed and if it can bring on the flu virus and so on and when you're and it make make you more unhealthy because of the stress that you're under so anything that compromises your health or development is going to impact the, the hardiness of the plant and that goes from everything from just uh, poor canopy due to disease uh, things like potentially like virus uh, drought or too much water uh, previous winter injury and some soil issues all of the, all of those types of things can result in and poor vine health. And so the one trump card moving to the spring this year is how much winter injury uh, had, had occurred last year, but the vine still got through the season, had a crop and so on. Are we going to see more collapse because of previous winter injury? And the answer is likely yes. It's last, last winter being tough is not going to um, help us out any way positively, I don't think, <laughs> moving forward to this year. This is an issue we see all the time, and this is one of the reasons why most of our vineyards are tiled, if not every other row, every single row in Ontario, and that's because uh, vines with wet feet do not acclimate well. And there's just an example of a, of a very wet spot in the vineyard. You see stunted growth. You could see the canes have not hardened off and there's no leaves. Therefore, those vines are likely not going to get through the winter. So in terms of just general um, points to make about how to optimize vine hardiness, and this is a combination of, of other work, but also a lot of work that we've been doing over the last five years. And one of the first things is, is selection of plant material. I mean, whether it's healthy plant material, uh, right from the get-go, right from the nursery, as well as matching that, that plant material to, goods, to the site. Uh, you can, if you try to force a variety into a situation where it's not going to do well, you're likely not going to get that the fruit mature nor the vine uh, optimized in terms of its cold tolerance. So again, that goes with proper site selection and, and proper preparations. You want to control your disease, good canopy management. Again, that goes without saying in terms of good wine quality. Manage vigor and water through tiling or, or irrigation. Again, you don't want too much water stress, but you don't want the plant to have uh, no stress at all and be overly vigorous. Based on some of the data I, I presented, you want to manage your crop levels according to variety, but also to the growing season, and also avoid uh, the effects of winter injury by using spare parts viticulture and replacing trunks regularly, especially after tough years, leaving extra uh, renewals and, and so on on the, on the vine. And like I said, it's a combination of multiple factors. It's not only the, 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 the variety itself, but also the environment and everything that we do to that vine. Basically, any decision we make in the vineyard can ultimately impact the hardiness. Whether it's a degree here, a degree there, it'll, it'll ultimately add up and there'll be cumulative effects. 
So the second part of the presentation that I want to talk about is some freeze protection strategies. And this has been a really important aspect of viticulture in Ontario recently, in the last um, 10 years or so. And one of the big things that's really changed our industry has been the use of wind machines. And that's one way that vines can be protected in the winter. Another thing that we do is we bury parts of the plant. We generally hill our graft unions, or in, t in, in some cases like Prince Edward County, we bury the entire uh, vine uh, with soil. One of the new things I'm gonna talk a bit about some of the research we've been doing has been looking at geotextile materials and some other sources of how you can uh, protect plants from freezing or include mulches, some various heat sources. People have played around burning fires and smoke, but those don't really work too well. Um, there's some equipment there that actually have propane uh, heaters on them, which you can try to heat the, the orchard or, or vineyard. Um, sprinklers have been used historically for frost protection. In many cases, it's a combination of multiple strategies. So some for midwinter protection, some for like frost protection in the spring. So the one area of work that I did some work with a, a couple of years ago and have some small trials still going now has been the use of geotextiles. So geotextiles are, used, are materials that we've been using for winter protection, mainly in Quebec. Um, and they also have a lot of applications like for mine industry to reduce erosion, um, nurseries, and so on. Um, there's been a lot of interest in using them lately, um, partly because of the success of, of the, the use of them in some Quebec vineyards, um, and the fact that people are concerned about moving a lot of soil around when you're burying vines, you're, you're moving a lot of soil, there's a lot of damage that can occur to the buds in the process of, of burying them or unburying them. Um, also, the associated effects of um, bud rot and loss, when, you, when you're covering uh, a plant with soil, uh, you can increase the amount of uh, rot in terms of your buds, so you're losing buds not from freeze injury, but due to rot or actually physical damage. And with that comes poor yields. But in recent years, um, with the last couple of really hard winters where we haven't been able to use things like wind machines because of the wind, um, there's been more interest in looking at geotextiles. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this during this, uh, during this lecture. So here's one problem that you have when you bury vines with soil. And this, I actually took this in uh, December of this past year, or last year, I should say. And what happens is if you cover the plant with, with soil, um, your, your, your vines are only as covered as well as your, 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 your hilling, really, and in terms of you might have some limitations due to the, um, the type of soil that you have, uh, heavier clay soils and wetter soils, wetter clay, like when you're trying to hill in November, December, it can be tough to, uh, to get proper coverage because of clumping, because of rocks, and so on and so forth. If that soil doesn't freeze, really right away, and you have a lot of rains and, and, and freeze thaws during the winter months, what can happen is you can, the, the soil will just wash off the plant. And that's what we're seeing here, where these were covered um, earlier in the season, but we had a warm December in 2014 and some rains and it basically washed that soil off. So if there's a freeze event that occurs um, where the temperatures are lower than the hardiness of those buds right there, those, you've lost your entire um, crop for that next year because they're going to be highly, highly susceptible to freeze injury. So one one of the things that happened was we decided after going to Ontario, or not going to Ontario, after going to Quebec, and we saw some of these materials, I was really interested to see okay, how are they going to, how does it impact the survival of the buds, but also how does it impact cold hardiness? Because if you're warming the temperature around those around those buds, will they be uh, less cold tolerant and therefore, yeah, you may be helping the, the, the mitigate the cold temperature, but at the same time, you might be compromising the vines due to a greenhouse effect. So we want to look to see what kind of impact these materials could have on hardiness as well as survival. And we also started to want to look at some best practices. Um, so Margaret Appleby in, uh, from Omafra had a roll of material, and so we decided to do a small study in Prince Edward County. So the first experiment was pretty primitive. We just wanted to see how it would work. So we used eight panels of vines. Um, we randomized these panels in the Chard in a Chardonnay block. And we basically had, for each of these eight panels, we had uh, some of them with uh, where the, the material was laid right on top of the tied canes. And the other ones were actually, we decided just to spur prune the vines, tented on top. And then what I did was I had temperature loggers underneath the 
the material as well as um, to, to measure the temperature under the material as well as ambient vineyard temperature and then also looked at uh, harvesting the buds to see how they impact the hardiness. Well, here's the impact that we found of the materials on, on temperatures. And you could see through from this ch chart, yeah, it's messy because it's all minimum temperatures for every day from November to April, but you could see the general trend here that when the vines that were left unprotected were experiencing temperatures in mid-January below negative 20. Uh, I, think, I think the actual temperature was negative 22.3 or something here. So that's enough to cause damage in the plant. The, with the temperatures under the geotextiles really did not go below negative um, 15, even at the coldest times. So they were, they were very effective in terms of mitigating some of the cold, uh, the cold temperatures. However, this was the year where we had really, really warm temperatures in the spring. And with the geotextile materials, you could see here, this period of time where we had temperatures going over 30 degrees with the materials. I think, I think we were experiencing temperatures like 20 something degrees during that time. And again, another 10 degrees were added on to that. It'd be nice to have 20 degree weather right now. <laughs> but yeah, it's just been a, a long winter. But you can see here that that's, that's, that's uh, nerve wracking, right? What I, what I explained about how, uh, how warmer temperatures can cause plant, plants to deacclimate, you might now be putting those, those vines at risk. And so the grower uh, immediately removed the materials from those. He didn't even let me get out there to, uh, to go out there myself. He removed them because he says, I don't want to have any, I don't know what the temperatures are under there, but I just know it can't be good. But that was a problematic year with buried vines because people started to dehill in late March and then we had cold temperatures in April. So very, very dangerous to be using those types of methods where you have no flexibility. Anyways, how did, I'll finish telling that story, but before we get there, um, just in term, terms of the impact on the hardiness, you could see that the, the geotextiles did reduce the hardiness of the, of the plants. Again, they weren't exposed to the same amount of cold temperature and they were less hardy by a couple of degrees at least. But again, the temp if the temperatures didn't drop below negative 15, uh, the vines would be fine, we're seeing no damage at all. One of the interesting things that we did find from this study was um, that the materials were removed, like I said, during mid-March, and the vines were unburied about a week or so later. At the end of April, we had the, the cold temperatures at negative six, or colder in, in regions across Ontario, but it was negative six in this particular vineyard. And as you know, that pretty much wiped out the, the apple industry that year and so on. Um, so the people were running a lot of wind machines in, in Niagara and so on, but in this particular case, there were no wind machines or have you. And what we found at harvest was, even when the crews were going through, they were, they'd, they'd look at these vines and say, wow, they have like a big crop on them, full crop compared to the other vines. And they're like, that's weird. Why is it just this random panel? And then they look on the wire and there was a tag there. So that was a tag of where some of these geotextiles were. So from that, all of a sudden the grower was interested. Okay, let's do this, let's try to do this study again. So I was able to secure some funding and do this study, uh, expand on the study and look in a little bit more detail. So with the expanded study, what we did was we looked at two different types of materials because I was interested and I was approached by some different companies to trial some different materials. So I'm like, okay, let's see what the impact of uh, different geotextiles have. And so we had one which I showed you earlier with the white polyester felt, and then the other one had like a black plastic underneath the material. Looking at, we wanted to look at two different timings of removal. So one at the beginning of deacclimation and one later on. So I wanted to see, okay, if we leave these materials on for a longer period of time, will they impact um, the deacclimation rate and put these vines, could they potentially put these vines at, at more risk? And again, we want to look at comparing these to buried vines as well as vines that were unprotected. And we looked at two locations, uh, one site in Prince Edward County and the other one in Vineland in Niagara, and two cultivars. We want to look at a uh, variety like Chardonnay and, a, and another in a red. Uh, so we decided to look at Pinot Noir. Um, and then we again did the same type of thing. We looked at monitoring these uh, the temperatures below the, the material as well as doing the bud hardiness work. So there's just an example of uh, how we had everything randomized in the block, uh, when we had individual panels with the, um, with the polyester felt and then the one with the plastic here, as you can see some of the differences. 
And there's just an example of a grower who, who found out about uh, the work we were doing and saw the results. And so in the neighboring vineyard, he did, this, he did his own similar trial. And I said, okay, I'll put some data loggers under here as well. Um, so I looked at some of, of, of these, but there's an example of just how the canes were tied down and we left extra canes. So I was able to actually go underneath the material and harvest them. And here's just an example of the two ways we did it. One was, and this was the, the grower actually, um, he had it more tented and with, uh, uh, here's just some of the data loggers we used and this is what we did in Vineland. Uh, we had 11 foot wide material and we draped it actually over the, the what is it, the second or third catch wire. But when you do it this way, you don't get very good results. You need to have that material closer to the ground. So I'll focus only on the data from the county. So how did the, these different materials or bearing, how did it mitigate cold temperatures? And you can see here that in December, um, the coldest temperatures obviously were the ambient and basically they were only in this, when temperatures reached negative 11 outside underneath the materials were only about negative seven degrees and the soil at all periods of time was, had the greatest insulating effect. So temperatures were only uh, negative three under the soil. Midwinter, we hit negative 23. Again, that's, those are temperatures that would cause a lot of damage to Chardonnay or Pinot Noir. Under the material, without snow protection, we found it, it, it helped mitigate the temperature about five degrees. And again, under the soil, it was only negative 10. So again, soil has, was, was very good at insulating the vines. But when you had snow cover, the effects were much greater. So when temperatures in February dropped down negative 25, so you're talking probably 90% bud kill, underneath the materials uh, were negative 17 or basically cut in half to negative 14. And again, under the soil with snow cover, negative six. And we found that cons uh, consistently. So when, with snow cover, additional snow cover, huge amount of protection with, uh, with, with some of these uh, methods. Um, during March, uh, we found that the, uh, some of the temperatures, the, the maximum temperatures were much higher, as well as the average temperatures were higher uh, with the geotextiles, but we weren't too concerned with, uh, with, with some of the results that we found there. And here's just an example of how um, the, tem the minimum temperatures changed throughout the dormant period with the geotextiles. And you can see here, yeah, you have a lot of ups and downs during acclimation, which can be concerning in terms of if you put it on very early and, this, and it's very warm out, you definitely need to be careful. But once you have snow protection, you can see that the temperatures really start to uh, flatline a lot more. And then once you lose that snow protection, you have those warmer temperatures again, there's a lot of bounce in the data. And those are things to be concerned with uh, for um, deacclimation. So how did they impact bud hardiness? knowing about that, the, the, some of those temperature differences. The first thing is that some of the materials did reduce the, uh, the acclimation. The vines did not get as cold tolerant uh, in December, but maximum temperatures were, weren't too bad. Like a couple degrees difference here and there, but there was no significant, no significant differences. However, you do have to be aware if, if, if it is a very warm fall or warm winter, um, you can, you can greatly reduce the cold tolerance of, uh, of some of these plants, or some of these vines. In terms of deacclimation, uh, this is just an example of, of how, if the material was removed earlier, um, the, the plants were, the vines were more hardy than those when, those treatments that had been removed, uh, or sorry, that, compared to those treatments that had the material left on. So it can be advantageous to, to take them off earlier, but there's also, um, ways of um, using the geotextiles so that you have flexibility of, of removing them off the vine. And, and that's the next stage of what people are doing in Quebec where you're using systems like wires and so on and, and clipping the geotextiles to a low wire on the ground. And then when you have warm periods, you lift up the, the catch wires basically, clip them on to some, to some clips on the post, and then you can always drop that material back down to the ground in a, in a spring frost event or, or, or a late winter freeze event. So it gives you more flexibility. Whereas if you're burying the vines and you have to unbury and then rebury, which happened in 2012, uh, you're just having huge amount of uh, risk for bud damage due to uh, dehilling. 
So there's actually probably some more flexibility with the geotextiles. However, this slide here was the thing that really changed uh, the dynamics for me in terms of using these things versus bearing. And that's the yield uh, component or data, where basically it didn't matter when the material was taken off, taken off or what material used, double the, the amount of uh, yield on the plant. And both for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and then look at the difference in terms of the canopy. This was not just a random picture where I just chose the best vine and the worst vine. This is actually how it looked from panel to panel. So this vine was one that was covered with geotextiles. You could see the shoot growth is more uniform. You could see it has uh, clusters on every shoot compared to a berry vine that has very uneven growth and just uh, a lot less clusters. So it was, to me, that was like night and day when I walked in the block. You could see the literally, literally the, the panels, you know, how, how, the, how the experiment was randomized just again by how the growth and the crop that you had on the plant. So what did we find? We found that the geotextiles did uh, moderate the minimum temperatures and helped uh, protect the vines uh, from the cold winter months. And that the snow cover actually remi re remained on those vines longer than, than the, the buried vines because it's that white material and the snow was, was not as quick to, uh, to melt. And like I showed with some of that data, um, it, with the snow cover, they, the, the materials really work well. Um, we did, did have some impact on the hardiness of the, of the plant because you are creating a warmer environment throughout winter, but uh, it, it wasn't uh, enough to jeopardize the, the vine, at least in the years that we did the trials. And the biggest thing, one of the biggest things was the yields were improved uh, considerably, with doubling the yields. Uh, the other thing, and, and this has been consistent from year to year, and I've been talking to some growers in the county as well as Quebec, um, and they said that they've, they've seen yield improvements with using the geotextiles. Everyone's still trying to figure out the best way to install them and use them, but generally speaking, unless it's a really high uh, cropped year in, in these regions, the, the geotextiles always have better yields. And a lot of, and the canes look a lot better. Healthier canes, they look, uh, they look really, really good when you unearth or when you, when you take the materials off versus a buried one, which have a lot of rot, disease, and crown gall. You get a lot of crown gall when you're burying vines because of you're nicking them and, and, and creating infection points. Um, so that was a, a real interesting thing to see as well. One of the only problems that we found, I didn't find this in the county though, I found this only in, in Niagara, was rodent damage. And I've, I've, I have seen some pictures from growers who have been using uh, the textiles in other regions and when there's a lot of snow cover and it's very warm under there, the, the voles and the rabbits and stuff love uh, going underneath there. And we had actually entire vines that were stripped, like trunk, everything, not nothing left. And that was just an example of a, of a cane. And you can see the buds chewed right off. And uh, yeah, buds are tasty. And they really like Riesling, for example. I don't know why, they love Riesling. So the last thing I want to talk about was um, basically, you're all familiar with the vinyl program. I just want to show you some impacts that I think this program has had, even with some of our severe winters where there's been, there has been damage. Um, so the cold hardness program, vinyl alert, is where we monitor cold tolerance uh, throughout the dormant period across all the regions across Ontario and have all this data available, open access to the grape and wine industry so that they can use this to uh, help mitigate uh, cold damage through wind machine use and so on. We remember these years. These were two years we had in uh, the winter of 2002, 2003, and 0405. So everyone who's been growing grapes or making wine in Ontario are very familiar with these two years. Again, the data is a little bit messy, so I'll walk you through it here. These are minimal temperatures for these two given years. 2002-3 was interesting because, oh, and this data, I should have put it on there, is from Violent Station. So it's one of the warmer um, temperature sites that, that we have historical data for. It's right in the lake at uh, Vineland Research, uh, Vineland Campus. Um, you can see that in, 20, in 2002, um, the, the winter actually wasn't too, too bad in terms of the temperatures. But since it's a warmer uh, winter, generally speaking, compared to some of the other years, four, four or five, and, and the last two that I'm going to talk about, 
Um, the vines probably deacclimated a bit, and the most damaging events actually occurred in the spring. And I think, if you recall, that's when a lot of the damage occurred. So it wasn't a winter like, like uh, 2014 or 2015 here, uh, but it resulted in a huge amount of damage uh, across, across Ontario. That was followed two years later by another cold year, and we had extended periods of cold in uh, January and February, and this again resulted in a lot of damage. And I'll show you some some uh, yield totals from those from those years uh, in the next couple slides. So I just want to give you uh, a picture of these were two bad years in terms of winter injury prior to wind machines, prior to vine alert. And you, but you could also see how the, how the years were different. So there are significant cold years, but they were much different in terms of their nature. Flip this to the last two years, uh, 2013-14 and 14-15. And you could see here that um, last year we were really cold uh, starting December and into January. And we were basically cold uh, throughout the, uh, the entire winter. And look at those temperatures, much colder even than 20, uh, 2004, 2005 um, in, in, in both years. So we sustained a little bit of damage here, here, you know, throughout the winter months. It was a lot. It wasn't just one event. It was a combination of many. This year, we were warmer, actually, uh, in December. And then we started getting the cold uh, in January and February, just ridiculously cold. You could just see that. So these are some of the coldest temperatures that Vineland Station has received that I that I found or, or reached, I should say, that I found uh, in in the last twenty years of data from there. Probably the last time it was that cold was uh, probably late seventies or eighties, I think. Um, but looking back, at the, I look back to eighty two, and um, and Mary helped with that. Uh, we didn't um, we didn't see temperatures like like this. And if you look now, we're, 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 we're having temperatures that are colder than they were in 2002, but the vines haven't lost any hardiness because it's been so bloody cold. Um, so they, they're not, they were not at risk at the beginning of March, whereas 2002, they got hit really bad. So here's some example of uh, yield, yield data uh, from, from, for grape production across Ontario over the last uh, what, uh, 15 years. 15 years, um, and you can see here that those, here's 2002, so it was reflective of the 2003 vintage. Look how low the, the grapevine production was in this year as well as 2005. So we're down below uh, 30,000 uh, tons. Then there's started to become more use of wind machines. Those that had wind machines, uh, some of the pioneers, uh, like, like shout out Charms, and then some early grower adopters uh, started to use these. And in these vintages, they had much better success rate than other vineyards. So the growers adopted this right away. You could see it. You could see the, the effectiveness of them. So wind machine use increased. And then look how the consistency of, of yields uh, over the next couple of years. Then we introduced Vine Alert in 2010. And again, we saw uh, more growth. Uh, more grape production. Yes, this is some of this is due to increased acreage and so on, but we also, with that increased acreage, probably have more percentage of vinifera as well, which are more cold tolerant or less cold tolerant. But I showed you the date of how tough last winter was, and look where the where the grape production was. Over, uh, I think it was just less, or just over fifty thousand. So I think that shows that through some of the mitigation strategies we've been using, we've been able to help reduce. Uh, winter injury. We don't know what the, uh, there is no crystal ball to say where we will be after this last winter, but you know, I think that's a big difference for how tough of a winter was last year compared to these two, and we had much better uh, crop because of some of these things. I'm not saying it's all, it's all due to wind machines or vinyl, but I think they definitely helped. So with that, I'd like to just thank all the, all the different partners that we have, uh, both wineries and growers, um, and all the people here at Brock and, and elsewhere that help with the whole cold hardiness program. The research and outreach program is quite large, uh, and so it takes a lot of people. It's just not me. So I thank all of you, and also all of our funding agencies and stakeholder groups, as well as 
other uh, partners. So with that, I'd like to be happy to take any questions. I've got a question for one of our online stores today. Um, Todd, was wondering if there's any correlation or specific data on how crop load and harvest timing affects the cold climate hybrid. Um, no, I don't have any. I don't have any data myself on on those. Uh, however, there's been some studies. Uh, if if they're specifically looking at Minnesota varieties, I don't have any information on those. But there have been some published papers looking at uh, Vidal and Chamberson, and basically, if the vines were not overcropped with really heavy crops, uh, the impact on cold tolerance was was minimal. No, I don't know. I don't know what the cost is for bearing vines, but I did write down. I did have an economic analysis or an, an economic slide, uh, but I took it out just in the interest of time. So, in terms of type, depends on the type of material, but looking at geo, geotextiles, it's somewhere in the range of four thousand to five thousand, fifty-five hundred per acre. Um, but it depends on how much material you buy. The more material you buy, the better deal you get. Um, and and that's uh, in Quebec. They talk kilometers. They don't talk meters. Uh, of material. And then in terms of, so that's your capital cost, and then it takes about 20 man hours to install a kilometer of material. 20. 20, and then about half that to take it off. Uh, so what's the life of the material if I need? Yeah, the life of the material, there's been some growers in Quebec that have been using it for over six, seven years, and they said it still looks brand new. However, if you have clips or if you have canes and, and vine parts sticking out, you can highly, like, you can reduce the, the life of the material uh, dramatically. So they said the, the way you install it is really important. So that's why they've been using more wire systems and actually um, building the infrastructure right off the, right the get-go for using the geotextiles. And it's a lot harder to adapt geotextiles to your training system um, if you have uh, like a traditional training system that you would have here in Niagara, for example. It's, it's t tougher to get that, that material to be covered, or to cover the vines correctly, I should say. And Jim, it's done completely by hand? It's done completely by hand. They roll it out like netting, um, basically, and this is what we've done with some of our trials here, where you have um, a post on the back of a tractor, and you have, a, you have it there, and you just unroll it with a number of people. Uh, they are looking at ways to mechanize it more and more, um, but we haven't done any trials like that yet. But in, the, in some of the wineries, each winery, from what I understand, and grower that are using this do it slightly different, and people are trying different things. So a lot of people are experimenting with, with how, what's the best way to use these um, in terms of um, uh, cost saving and so on. But the big question is the durability. Um, the Quebec, Quebec people have been doing this for six, six years. They have a little bit of problem, how do they deal with it? Um, some, some of them have. Uh, also, they, some of them even put mulch underneath them, even underneath the material for what they use for when they use it for vinifera. And what they do to reduce rodent damage is they put bait traps, uh, baiting stations, I should say, uh, under the material. And so they, they actually have some poison underneath there to, uh, to deal with the, the rodent damage. Are there any producers who are using geotextiles that are leaving it, as you suggested, gathered on a catch wire? much like we do with netting here, so that you don't actually remove it every single year. And is it durable enough to do that? Uh, the problem with doing it that way, that, like to leave it almost like the Gentech permanent netting, is that you're gonna shade your canopy um, and, you're, and you're not going to allow sunlight into the, into the actual canopy. Um, I've, I've heard about people using geotextile type materials to create like basically greenhouse effect to uh, in, improve maturity. Um, in some really cool climate regions, um, but now I don't know anyone that has tried that. And like I said, the higher you have the material in the in the from the ground, the, the less effective it is. It needs to be close to the to the ground for it to work well. So you do have to have a lower um, a lower fruiting zone, or you, know, you have to bend the, the, the vine down to the ground. Like there's many ways that people are trying to protect the vines over the winter, and, and so. Um, you have to sometimes change your training system and so on, but that adds another layer of complications because you may not have uh, a good canopy management with the way the vines are trained. Thanks. So it can be a bit of a catch-22. Any other questions? 
Um, your cold hardiness research is um, pretty much dedicated to uh, Pinot, um, Cap Franc, Merlot, Sauvignon Blanc, Riesling, and Chardonnay. Can you review for everybody why you've chosen those varieties and if there's any pressure, which I'm sure there must be, pressure for you to look at other varieties as well? Okay, the reason why we chose those ones for the crop level studies was we wanted to choose some core vinifera varieties that are uh, that are most uh, widely planted, uh, such as Chardonnay, Cabernet Franc, um, Riesling, but we also wanted to look at some cool tender varieties as well, some of our most cool tender ones. So, um, Merlot and Sauvignon Blanc are two of our most cool uh, tender varieties, so that's why we chose, chose those ones. Um, in terms of pressure, look at other varieties. I've been testing cold tolerance of many varieties that we grow. I probably have over 50 or more varieties that I've tested in terms of looking at their cold tolerance to see what's suitable or potentially suitable for Ontario. So I have looked at almost as much as I could in terms of uh, different varieties, but there's always new people or always new varieties being tested. So I'm definitely interested in those types of things. Yeah. I didn't show the data, but yeah, I've got data on Sangiovese, San Tempranillo. Um, yeah. And then some of the varieties are um, surprisingly uh, cold tolerant compared to, like you wouldn't think they'd be, but a variety like Petit Verdot is one of the most hardy uh, Bordeaux varieties that we found. So, and whereas Semillon is one of the most cool tender. And we used to have a lot more Semillon in the ground, um, but some of the winters have been tough on it. But you look at the data and you understand why. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? That's me. I'll move this. <laughs> Sorry. Um, thank you. Thank you again, Jim. It's great to see so many grower and uh, winery people here today. Really appreciate the um, the support. Um, it's my. Oh, anyway. So thank you, Jim. And uh, please join me in thank. You. I have a gift for you. Um, it's not actually a cork, it's actually a USB. Oh, cool. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to announce our last um, speaker um, in the lecture series. On Monday, April the 13th, uh, we have Covey Professional Affiliate Wendy McFadden-Smith coming. She's also an adjunct professor with the Department of Biological Sciences here at Brock University. Um, she is with Tender Fruit and Grape uh, IPM, she's an IPM specialist for the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. And her topic is viruses, vectors and vines, oh my. So please uh, join me again in thanking Jim and uh, hopefully we will see you all on April the 13th.